is uh, really not not advised to attend. All right, we've got Jeff Simmons who is milling about uh, the crowd uh, just below me here at uh, 46th Street. Let's uh, send it over down to him. Hi, Jeff. Roma, I just got the news a few minutes ago about what was taking place as far as this being filled to capacity. So I'm just uh, breaking the news to those who've been lucky enough to get a front row seat here. Fill to capacity. No one else getting in anymore. Uh, Mark, how do you feel about that? Well, I'll tell you, this has been exciting. We've been here since 10 o'clock this morning waiting this thing out. It's... Did you think you'd last this long? Well, yeah, we came with that in mind all the way from Tennessee. How long do you stay until? Do you leave at 12.01 or are you going to stay until 6 a.m. when it all wraps up? 12.01, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Not even 12.15? Well, maybe 12.15. Maybe 12.15. Yeah, it's been there's a, a there's long day. There's been a lot of pressure this year on, like, making the ultimate resolutions now that we're starting, you know, the new millennium. What's your New Year's resolution? I've already been working on that. I'm going to read more and travel more. Well, you travel to New York City Absolutely. for this one. What's your resolution? I plan to do well in college. What's your name? Jerry. Jerry, what year in college are you? Um, I'll be starting here in next fall. Okay, and what's your major going to be? Uh, architecture. Good luck uh, with your architecture major. Now, what is your New Year's resolution? I believe I'd like to train for a marathon. Now, I've got to say, you guys came here from Tennessee. Was it just because you wanted to be here on New Year's Eve, or were there other reasons you came? Well, we've been to two play. Uh, well, we went to a play last night. And we're going to a play tomorrow night. So we've got other plans. And my family's in New Jersey. How do you normally celebrate New Year's Eve in Tennessee? Oh, at home watching the ball drop and then so going would, to bed. <laughs> so you would watch us every year here. Oh yeah. Now we got one more from Tennessee over here. You guys yeah, from Tennessee? Yeah. You guys are from Tennessee. Tell me a little about. What it, what it has meant to you to be here tonight? Well, it's great. It's been really fun. Um, the crowd is great. You meet just all kinds of people. I mean, there's a guy over there from New York, have some people from Australia, and it's just really neat to see all the different cultures and everybody just here having a good time. And you've been having a good time so far? Uh, I've been having a great time. Yeah, uh, you're wearing, I guess, a raincoat. You were prepared for any type of weather here? Well, it was, a, it was a little rainy this morning. It was kind of misty, so we came prepared. Yeah, you got here what time? About 10 o'clock this morning. About 10 a.m. And you're staying until 12.01 as well? Or? You bet. You're not even going to try to stick it out until 6 a.m.? Oh, I don't know about that. That might be too long. I've already been here going on, I guess, about 10 hours or so, so working on. Now, for many people, the issue in coming here tonight was not Y2K. No fears about that. The big issue was where to pee. What have you guys been going through? Well, it's been kind of tricky. You just kind of have to work your way out and beg and plead and hope one of the cops is nice and lets you back in. How have the police been so far tonight? They've been they've been great. I've been really pleased. I was Eight, surprised. 8,000 police officers just in Times Square. I believe about 19,000 are dispatched across the city. Were there any concerns about coming here tonight? Any safety concerns? Not really. What went through your mind uh, when... Uh, you got here tonight uh, when you saw the number of police officers. I felt very safe with all the. Police. What's been the show? Uh, what's the show been like so far for you two? It's been pretty good. It's been neat watching all the different, I guess, floats come down or whatever you want to call those. It's been really exciting. So this is our Tennessee crowd. You guys are part of the 85 percent of uh, out of towners who come here, but I believe we got one of the one percent of New York City residents over here. A lot of people from New York City decided not to come here tonight. They said, we're just getting the heck away from Times Square. Why'd you come here? Uh, because I've lived in New York City for 15 years now, and this is the first time I would be in Times Square. So First I, time? First time this year, yeah. And I figured if I'm going to do Times Square, I'm going to do the big one. What have you done the previous years? Um, I've either been out of town or just celebrated quietly with friends. They've all said it was too insane to come to Times Square any other time. and. So I figured if I'm going to go to the insane one, it's going to go to the yeah. real insane one. Now, I'm not trying to stump you on this, but we were asking this in the newsroom before. We call it the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. What do we call the next decade? I've heard people say the aughts before. And the I think, aughts. yeah, I would say the aughts too, yeah. Or just the zeros. What, uh, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Anyone have any idea? What are we going to call the next decade? The I don't know. Another the vote. Aughts. Another vote for the aughts, yeah. <laughs> now, what about that whole issue of, you know, the new millennium doesn't start at midnight tonight, it starts next year? I'm one of the ones that say it starts next year, but I've totally bought into the whole Y2K uh, promotion and uh, commercialism this now, year. Now, this costs $7 million to throw this party here uh, mm -hmm. this New Year's Eve. Do you think we're going to be doing it again next year? I have a feeling, yeah. With, with American capitalism, sure, they're going to throw another $7 million party. Another $7 million yeah. party. Now, one thing I noticed from here, I don't think we're able to see it too well. Kenton, if you're able to zoom over to the McDonald's, I don't know if you're able to see that at all. McDonald's has tablecloths actually on the tables tonight. 
There's a party going on in there. So we're going to be able to uh, be here for the next few hours and bring you more sights and sounds from the crowd. Roma, we're throwing it back to you. Hey, Roma. Thank you, thank you. I can barely hear there was uh, some... Our Millennium Countdown continues now with another live look at Times Square where the crowds have been gathering since early this morning. That's where we also find our Jeff Simmons who gives us a very late. Jeff? Lewis, every year it seems to get bigger and I've got to say it seems to get better. A number of people I've spoken to tonight on street level say that while this might be their first taste of Times Square on New Year's Eve, they're expecting to come back next year and many of them joke to me that, well, this isn't really the turn of the century. It's next year, so that'll give them an excuse to come back next year. This is what you're going to see over the next half hour at about 7.45. You'll be hearing ominous sounds and dark clouds of a rough sea, which will fill Times Square. And you'll be able to see a number of gossamer ships that complete their journey to Times Square from the remote Atlantic Islands. You'll also see a number of uh, dolphin puppets leading these two giant ships before we were able to see Father Time, we were able to see uh, Baby Time, the new, uh, the new Year's Baby. You will be able to see some giant ships heading through uh, the crossroads of the world at that point. Now, I'm just going to look over for uh, a while now. It seems that this is one of those sleep mode periods when people are really calming down. And uh, down on the ground, I notice a few people are just sitting down, a few uh, resting their eyes right now because periodically during the day they've decided that they're able to uh, brave this cold weather, but it's not as chilly as they had uh, predicted. Some of them even told me they're a bit warm because they've uh, bundled up some six, seven layers thick of clothing tonight. And many people didn't heed the warnings and are not even wearing hats. Instead, they're wearing uh, 2,000 party hats and 2,000 glasses. Now, in a short while, we're hoping to bring to you an interview with Dr. Marianne Hopkins. She is uh, the woman who's been chosen to uh, represent Doctors Without Borders in uh, touching the button that starts the ball on its uh, one-minute descent at midnight. And when we uh, get her down here on the press riser, I'll be able to bring that interview to you. For now, uh, Jeff Simmons in Times Square. Lewis, let's send it on back to you. A little cold, but a nice night to be out there. Thank you so much, Jeff. And it's a good we weekend to take in a movie. Now, if you want to do that, here's New York. Right now, we're going to go back out to Times Square and our Jeff Simmons, who's standing by with a Millennium Big Wig. Jeff? In previous years, Lewis, we had an 88-year-old washerwoman, Osceola McCarty, uh, st start off the new year for us. And then we had five scrappy school kids from New York City schools. And then last year, the paralyzed Chinese gymnast Sang Lan was uh, up with Mayor Giuliani and Brendan Sexton to ring in the new year. And this year, our very special guest is Dr. Marianne Co Hopkins from Bellevue and NYU. Uh, she's affiliated with Doctors Without Borders. Tell us how you found out that you were going that you were chosen to do this well they called me about four weeks ago and I must say I thought it was a joke <laughs> I was dumbfounded the, the, I think one of the last things on earth I ever thought I'd be doing was pushing the button in Times Square on the millennium no less but I'm very very excited to be here now Doctors Without Borders won the Nobel Peace Prize this year tell me a little about Doctors Without Borders well we work in about 90 countries around the world and there are 2,000 volunteers per year 100 from the United States and it's a wonderful organization. We really try and bring health care everywhere that there is need, whether there is need because of a war, because of famine, because of a, another type of natural disaster. So we go anywhere that there is a need. Your own experience. You've been to Sri Lanka and I believe India. Tell me a little about your experiences abroad. Right. I've been to two war zones, and so I've done a lot of trauma surgery and a lot of war surgery. In Sri Lanka, I was the only surgeon for 500,000 people. And then in Burundi, in Africa, I was in the only surgeon in the southern part of the country, actually, the only hospital in the southern part of the country. What is the message that you hope to get out tonight by participating in this about your work and your organization's work? That the sense of global unity, which is so pervasive throughout today's event, will be reached by everyone, and that in the next millennium we can actually bring health care to everyone, regardless of where they are, really become a world without borders. Do you think a lot of people who you've spoken to in New York City understand what is going on abroad where people, where people uh, cannot get proper medical treatment? Well, I think that there are a lot of countries which are actually not very well recognized. For instance, Burundi, Sri Lanka, Angola, Sierra Leone. A lot of countries that we don't know a lot about what's been going on and the wars that have been going on there, the natural disasters. 
But Americans are such a generous people. And I think when they find out, their hearts just open up. And everyone has just been so supportive whenever I describe what I do. And I think it's just very exciting. Yeah, you said earlier you thought it was a joke when someone called you up and notified yeah. you of this. How were you chosen out of the 30 or so volunteers uh, in New York City? Well, I would recently come back from the field. I was in Burundi two months ago, uh, and I'm a physician that works in New York, and I think those two qualities, perhaps, are among the qualities that, uh, that led them to chose me. But I'm very honored. I really represent a large group of volunteers to really dedicate themselves to this kind of work. Now, um, I have the privilege already of meeting you about two weeks ago when you told me you had other plans originally. What were those plans? I was going to be in California with my husband's family, where it was nice and warm. <laughs> so then, what are you going to do next New Year's Eve? Oh, how can, you, how can you follow something like this up? I have no idea. I have no idea. I'll come up with something good. And what you guys can't see at home right now is uh, her husband right off camera over here videotaping us. Uh, at the press conference uh, when it was announced a few weeks ago, he did the same thing. So hello for your home video. Louis, we're going to send it on back to you in the newsroom. All right, thank you so much, Jeff. Now, in such a populated urban setting, it's hard to believe that a mosquito could create... In Times Square here. Let's throw it over to him. Hi, Jeff. Roma, it is interesting. It's getting a little colder right now. That's what it feels like. But all night we've been talking uh, to a number of revelers. They've told me how safe and secure they felt. So we're going to give a little credit to the NYPD out here. About 8,000 police officers have been out here tonight. I'm just going to pounce on two right now and ask them right over here, guys. You want to say hi to your family? Hey, hi. Love you. Miss you. Be home soon. What's your resolution? Re Renew your resolution. Better physical, mental health. It seems like everyone's been rather orderly tonight. Everything's safe, secure? Yeah, no problems. This has been better than the past years. Now, in previous years, there have been only mi a minor, small number of arrests. I've not seen anything like that tonight. What's the crowd been like tonight? Very calm. There hasn't been any alcohol, so everybody's pretty much behaving. Where yeah. are you from? I'm from Queens. You're from Queens. Where are you from? Long Island. Long Island. I'll stick with Queens first. That's our coverage. <laughs> but I'll come right back. <laughs> what do you normally do on New Year's Eve? Either at home or a house party. That's it. So when you found out you had to work tonight, but you found out you'd be in Times Square, what was your reaction? I pretty much assumed I'd be working from last year. I knew with the millennium everyone would work. So I just said I'm going to have to be here to make the best of it and make it safe for everyone in New York. And what's your family doing now? They should be at home, hopefully watching everything at home safely. So right now they're watching us on New York One. I would hope so. I hope they're watching right now. Yeah, I'll go to Long Island for one second here. How do you normally celebrate New Year's Eve? Actually, I usually go to a friend uh, house party every year. I bring it in in Queens. So you're usually at a house party. This is much more active and exciting. Uh, yeah, actually, this is my first time having to do this detail here. So. Guys, thank you very much for keeping everything thank safe you. and secure thank tonight. You. Have a happy okay. new year. Same to you. Happy new year. Roma, we're going to send it on back to you. I was hoping to see you start doing some of the, the moves, the samba moves. <laughs> Next time, next time. I promise. Let's, uh, thanks. Let's take a look now behind me. The dancers are just getting started in the, the, the offensive, but uh, they just handed out these uh, Mylar wigs, thousands of them, to the crowd, and uh, some of them are pretty hideous. Our Jeff Simmons is standing by. He's modeling one of them. Jeff. So, Roma, guess what I got for you? You said you wanted a wig. Well, they just handed out all these sparkly wigs. So all my friends back here have got the same wigs on for you. And I hope by the end of tonight, I'll be able to watch you donning this as well. These are just one of the handouts. What do you think of the wigs? They're great. This is the best part so far. <laughs> the best part? I thought the best part was, say, at midnight? Well, so far. I said okay. so far. Okay, so far. <laughs> oh, you guys have been a fun crowd tonight. So let me ask you this. At 12.01, when you evacuate, how easy do you think it's going to be to get out of this area? Not very easy. How long are you giving yourself to get home? About 30 minutes. <laughs> so how far is like the place you're staying tonight from here? About a block. One block, 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good luck on that one. Now, let me ask you this question. You ready? I think so. If you celebrate in grand fashion this year, what are you going to do to top it next New Year's Eve? Mm. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I guess I'll have to come back here again. <laughs> Get another but wig. But there's nothing like this one. <laughs> I want you to give a good wave with your wigs to our Woo! Roma Choi. We're going to send it back to you.
Thanks, Jeff. Not too bad, really. <laughs> Although, don't send any up here. Well, here we are watching uh, New Year's in Argentina, Chile, French Guiana, Greenland, Suriname, and Uruguay. And uh, as you can see, some of the most elaborate puppets uh, of the night were on display there. We saw butterflies and dragonflies and a 60-foot-long snake. And they were sending uh, foam butterflies uh, out, out of the windows, cascading down to all of us here below. It has been quite a pageant and a celebration and an amazing tribute to human ingenuity. Uh, this was a, a beautiful event. Unfortunately, it is winding down, but there's so much ahead. Out in the crowds, which have been very orderly thus far, we have our uh, Jeff Simmons, who's standing by. Jeff? Wilma, you're right. It has been an extremely orderly crowd. Every year we try to bring you some genuine moments, and I've got to say that over the last few years, I've done this now, this is my fourth year, we've had a great tech crew out here. And one of the guys who's been out here last year and this year I want to introduce you to is my good pal, my buddy here, Kenton Young. Kenton, you've been with New York One for how long? Three years. Three years. Now, this is your second New Year's Eve out here. What's it been like for you? Beautiful. What a thing to, you know, experience is once in a lifetime, especially the year 2000. A lot of work, a lot of work, right? Definitely, definitely. Now, your family, your friends, your honey, where are they tonight? Everybody's at home watching your honey? TV. She's at home, too. And what's her name? Her name is Shaniqua Batia. Shaniqua Batia. Now, um, obviously, you couldn't spend New Year's Eve together. Was there anything that you want to say to her tonight? Well, actually, there is. Um, baby, I know I told you I was winning a game. But really, the game, there is no game, really. The only game played here, I don't even know what the to say. I'm nervous, but um, in other words, would you marry me? He's shaking just a bit right now. Let's stand up here. Now, Ken Young is 20 years old. And uh, how long have you been dating? Three years. Three years now. We're not in touch with her right now, but we're hoping at a certain point tonight we will be able to get in touch with Shanika to find out her answer. You know, uh, this is in front of two million people here and millions more at home. I mean, are you confident? Pretty much. Pretty much. One last, one last thing. Describe her for me. What's she like? Just a beautiful woman. The most beautiful woman you ever met. Exactly. Well, good luck, Kenton. Congratulations. So we'll check back with you later. I hope everything goes well. Ken, best of luck, Rome. We're going to send it on back to you. Wow. That's, that's great. Congratulations, Kenton. We wish you all the best. And thank you, Jeff. Well, here we are. We're uh, looking at, looks like a pizza box in uh, all of the uh, islands in the Mediterranean. Or, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Caribbean. Uh, joining us now, once again, is our own Jeff Simmons, who's standing by in the crowd. Jeff. Now, Roma, I'm hoping you can hear us well because it's a little difficult now with the booming music which is going on right now. Now, I'm joined once again by our very own Kenton Young. I'm going to pass the headphones over to him because I believe we have uh, someone who wants to talk to him. So I'm going to try to do this well for you, folks. Okay. I've seen you here there. Okay. Hello. Kenton, say hello. 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 Hi. Is it? <laughs> I love you, baby. I love you, too. <laughs> so is that a yes? Huh? Is that a yes? Definitely yes. She said yes. She said yes! <laughs> Congratulations! Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Hello? Congratulations, Kent and Roma. We're going to send it on back to you. We made history tonight. That's, that's really terrific. New life, new year, new century, new millennium. That's great. Well, we're uh, awaiting New Year's in uh, the islands in the Caribbean, and uh, why don't we take a look at what's happening there. The islands, I'll list them for you. Antigua, Barbados, Barbuda, Bermuda, Bolivia. Am I boring you? No. I thought I heard a yawn. <laughs> Meanwhile, Albany leaders are trading plans on how to cope with rising oil costs. State Senate Majority Leader Joe Bruno wants a permanent end to the state's gasoline sales tax. And Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver is proposing a suspension on state gas taxes from the 4th of July through Labor Day.
with your what? Meanwhile, Albany leaders are trading plans on how to cope with rising oil costs. State Senate Majority Leader Joe Bruno wants a permanent end to the state's gasoline sales tax. And Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver is proposing a suspension on state gas taxes from the 4th of July through Labor Day. No, no, that's, is that, was that a shot? Oh, yeah, you're right, you're right, it is. Governor Pataki says he's considering the impact on the state budget over the next five years. He says both Silver and Bruno should look at this in a long, see I'm trying to change that, should take a long-term view. I'll just do, should take a long-term view? Okay. <coughs> Governor Pataki says he's considering the impact on the state budget over the next five years. He says both Silver and Bruno should take a long-term view. The both side. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no. Oh. Uh, I got it. Okay. I, I lost it for a moment there. Governor Pataki says he's considering the impact on the state budget over the next five years. He says both Silver and Bruno should take a long-term view as well. Yeah, this was an incredible story. 36, hmm? Yeah. Right now, so I'm glad on the runway as it comes down the track. I know. It's I wish there was footage of this. Oh, okay, that's a nerve at the top. Wait, I'm sorry, the story? Yeah, I, get, I guess I just, I lost the one that we were just in, so, no, the plane, I don't know what happened with that one. I must have done something with it. There we go. Yeah, I can't have fun with this one, though. I mean, it's, it's a good ending, but no one got injured. It was headed for Salt Lake City, but a Delta Airlines jet was forced to make an emergency landing back at San Francisco. Back. Okay, okay. I know. Is that I don't know if I was re. Okay. 
The thing is, I've noticed Pat and Lewis sometimes in Roma changing it. Oh, so I would, uh, yeah. okay. It was headed for Salt Lake City, but a Delta Airlines jet was forced to make an emergency landing in San Francisco shortly after takeoff last night. Officials say the pilot of flight 1972 told passengers the landing gear had broken after takeoff. The Boeing 727-200 circled the airport for about an hour before the emergency landing. The plane's right wing apparently dragged on the runway as it touched down, and passengers got out through an inflatable slide. No one was hurt. What? <laughs> oh no, I know. It, it took me a second because I thought it was you at the first thing. Like, I don't like my no one was hurt. Okay. No, I want to say no one was hurt because you know that's a good thing. You know, I would add, luckily, no one was hurt, but I don't know if luckily is too. And it's the thing is. Fortunate, fortunately. Yeah. I don't want you to be home cringing. Okay. For, fortunately, this time. <laughs> it was headed for Salt Lake City, but a Delta Airlines jet was forced to make an emergency landing at San Francisco. In San Francisco, sure. Yeah, I. It was headed for Salt Lake City, but a Delta Airlines jet was forced to make an emergency landing in San Francisco shortly after takeoff last night. Officials say the pilot of Flight 1972 told passengers that the landing gear had broken after takeoff. The Boeing 727-200 circled the airport for about an hour before em the emergency landing. The plane's right wing apparently had dragged on the runway as it touched down. Passengers got out through an inflatable slide, and fortunately, no one was hurt. For, unfortunately, no one was hurt. Unfortunately, no one was hurt. <coughs> it was headed for Salt Lake City, but a Delta Airlines jet was forced to make an emergency. Am I speaking too fast? Oh no, if it was 200 people died, it wouldn't have been. It was headed for Salt Lake City, but a Delta Airlines jet was forced to make an emergency landing in San Francisco shortly after takeoff last night. Officials say the pilot of Flight 1972 told passengers that the landing gear had broken after takeoff. The Boeing 727-200 circled the airport for about an hour before the emergency landing. The plane's right wing apparently dragged on the runway as it touched down, and passengers got out through an inflatable slide. Fortunately, no one was hurt. I know, I was smiling because I was like, no, I wasn't, I, I know it was like a, it's like a happy, but I realized it was like a, yeah. Fortunately, fortunately, no one was hurt. Fortunately. Should I do it again or go to?
Republished report says some donors to Hillary Rodham Clinton's U.S. Senate campaign may have been hoping for some influence on her husband. According to the New York Times, a group of Pakistani Americans raised about $50,000 for Mrs. Clinton uh, at a fundraiser she attended last month. The dinner was held while the president was... Sorry. I'll read it the way it's written, if that's okay. A published report says some donors to Hillary Rodham Clinton's U.S. Senate campaign may have been hoping for some influence on her husband, the president. According to the New York Times, a group of Pakistani Americans raised about $50,000 for Mrs. Clinton's campaign at a fu <laughs> What's tripping me, what's, yeah, what's, that keeps tripping me up, okay. This is previous. Right. Okay, I'm just going to act like I got this and I had to read it raw. A report says some donors to Hillary Rodham Clinton's U.S. Senate campaign may have been hoping for some influence on her husband, the president. According to the New York Times, a group of Pakistani Americans raised about $50,000 for Mrs. Clinton's campaign at a fundraiser she attended last month. The dinner was held while President Clinton was debating whether to visit Pakistan during his upcoming trip to Asia. Last week, the White House announced Mr. Clinton would go to Pakistan for, a, for five hours, but the move should not be seen as an endorsement of the coup there last year. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. Okay. The report says that some donors to Hillary Rodham's A report says that some donors to Hillary Rodham Clinton's US Senate campaign may have been hoping for some influence on her husband, the president. According to the New York Times, a group of Pakistani Americans raised about fifty thousand dollars for Mrs. Clinton's campaign at a fundraiser she attended last month. The dinner was held while President Clinton was debating whether to visit Pakistan during his upcoming trip to Asia. Last week, the White House announced that Mr. Clinton will go to Pakistan for five hours, but the move should not be seen as an endorsement of the coup there last year. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the President's decision. Okay. Pauses between pauses between the paragraphs are too long. <laughs> I guess no with that laugh. <laughs> no, okay, no. I don't remember it. You know, one of the reasons, one of the reasons I s slowed down there is because I think I read too fast. I mean, I've been told I read too fast, no, so I'm trying not to.
published a report says some donors to Hillary Rodham Clinton's U.S. Senate campaign may have been hoping for uh, a published report says some donors to Hillary Rodham Clinton's U.S. Senate campaign may have been hoping for some influence on her husband, the president. According to the New York Times, a group of Pakistani Americans raised about $50,000 for Mrs. Clinton's campaign at a fundraiser she attended last month. The dinner was hailed while President Clinton was debating whether to visit Pakistan during his upcoming trip to Asia. Last week, the White House announced Mr. Clinton would go to Pakistan for five hours, but the move should not be seen as an endorsement of the coup there last year. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. I know I've <laughs> when to pause and when not to pause. A report says some donors to Hillary Rodham Clinton's U.S. Senate campaign may have been hoping for some influence on her husband, the president. According to the New York Times, a group of Pakistani Americans raised about $50,000 for Mrs. Clinton's campaign at a fundraiser she attended last month. The dinner was held while President Clinton was debating whether to visit Pakistan during his upcoming trip to Asia. Last week, the White House announced Mr. Clinton would go to Pakistan for five hours, but the move shouldn't be seen as an endorsement of the coup there last year. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. I want to get the ends. I, I, and since since day one, when you've worked with me, I've always had a problem with landings. Oh, yeah. And and I know that, and I try to. I notice it. But but I do say a sometimes when we're talking. I I you made me cognizant of it one of the last times, and when I went out, I was with people, and I kept catching myself when I said it. A report says some donors to Hillary Rodham Clinton's U.S. Senate campaign may have been hoping for some influence on her husband, the president. According to the New York Times, a group of Pakistani Americans raised about $50,000 for Mrs. Clinton's campaign at a fundraiser she attended last month. The dinner was held while President Clinton was debating whether to visit Pakistan during his upcoming trip to Asia. Last week, the White House announced that Mr. Clinton would go to Pakistan for five hours but the move should not be seen as an endorsement of the coup there last year. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. Let me, let me tell you where my concern is in that sentence, why, what, go, what goes through my mind. Tell me if you think, I know that they're saying the White House announced but every time I get to that second half, I feel like it needs attribution, even though it doesn't. I mean, you've got the attribution here, and I keep thinking, but but oh, but I they said, the but they said the move should not be seen as an endorsement of the coup there last year. I feel like I need to add in, but they said that, but said that because it's in the fr it makes it seem like I'm saying it. Each time I do that, it goes through my mind.
A report says some donors to Hillary Rodham Clinton's U.S. Senate campaign may have been hoping for some influence on her husband, the president. According to the New York Times, a group of Pakistani Americans raised about $50,000 from Mrs. Clinton's campaign at a fundraiser she attended last month. The dinner was held while President Clinton was debating whether to visit Pakistan during his upcoming trip to Asia. Last week, the White House announced that Mr. Clinton would go to Pakistan for five hours, but said that the move could not be seen as an endorsement of the coup there last year. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. Okay. I was so focusing on that third graph. Is that okay? The okay. Well, I could put in a sock. I know. Level four being the more casual, like yeah. add-on, like you know, just one thing. Okay. Let me make me laugh. Okay. Okay. I'll do it one more time. Okay, next. I just want to feel like I've finally done one in its entirety. That could take forever, so I'll just make this the last time with this one. A report says that some donors to Hillary Rodham Clinton's U.S. Senate campaign may have been hoping for some influence on her husband, the president. According to the New York Times, a group of Pakistani Americans raised about $50,000 for Mrs. Clinton's campaign at a fundraiser she attended last month. The dinner was held while President Clinton was debating whether to visit Pakistan during his upcoming trip to Asia. Last week, the White House announced that Mr. Clinton would go to Pakistan for five hours, but said the move could not be seen as an endorsement of the coup there last year. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. I don't hear that. Woo -hoo. A report says some donors to Hillary Rodham Clinton's U.S. Senate campaign may have been hoping for some influence on her husband, the president. According to the New York Times, a group of Pakistani Americans raised about $50,000 from Mrs. Clinton's campaign at a fundraiser she attended last month. The dinner was held while President Clinton was debating whether to visit Pakistan during his upcoming trip to Asia. Last week, the White House announced that Mr. Clinton would go to Pakistan for five hours, but the move, they said, should not be seen as an endorsement of the coup there last year. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. Am I doing this too much also? Now you'll be aware of it, I feel. You should never? Oh, that, okay, I think that. <clears throat> a White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. Had no bearing on the president's decision. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. <laughs> no, but if I, but
Again, I'm trying not to smile now. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. On the president's decision. Had no bearing on the president's decision. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. A White House spokeswoman A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. On the president's on the president's decision. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. A White House spokesman told the Times that Mrs. Clinton's appearance had no bearing on the president's decision. Is Janine out there? Who or do you have anyone else? Okay, just let me know when I need to bounce out of here. Okay. What I wanted to show you, um, hopefully, I, um, I, I've got to leave for an interview at 4 o'clock. I wanted to show you the stuff from uh, the verdict. Okay, do, you, do you mind that? Is that okay? Okay. okay.